Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast and a very happy Father's Day 2024. I'm Bob DeMarco, and on this edition of the show, I'm speaking with John Roy of Dawson Knives. Though they only came on my radar about five years ago, Dawson Knives have been in business for 50 years, making premium custom outdoor adventure knives, swords, and one-of-a-kind masterpieces, proving once again I'm always late to the party. Today, the company is made up of three generations of Dawson family knife makers working together out of their shop near Prescott, Arizona. They have a huge following of fans, collectors, and users. We'll hear their story and take a look at the beautiful blades Dawson Knives creates. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. Another great way of helping the show is to share it with a friend. And uh, if you want to help it with a little bit of cash, you can go to Patreon, theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. John, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. Thank you, Bob, for having me on. Oh, it's it's a great pleasure. As I mentioned recently, um, Dawson Knives, I know you've been around a long time. I know that now. Uh, but but I think when you started um selling through blade hq is probably when i noticed you because i'm always there looking at what's new and uh and lo and behold you weren't new you were just new to me uh making incredible knives uh, before we launch into what you're doing right now uh at dawson knives let's talk a little bit about the history how did the company start oh uh, that's a good question bob uh our company started actually in 1973 so it was actually founded by barry dawson and that was out of his uh, garage uh, using a sharp, uh, actually it was shopping cart wheels to make his first grinder. And so we did a lot with 5160. We did a lot with uh, 440C at the time. So this is, this is all back in the 70s. Uh, we did really start hitting a little bit of our stride until the 1980s when he started making full tang, scale tang tactical knives. Uh, a lot of your, um, our first models was the 101, so it had a double guard, but it was made out of 440C. We just B-blasted the blades and put a micarta handle on it with a Kydex sheath. So it was it was pretty new, and uh, we wanted to make them tough, so they were a quarter inch thick. But throughout the ages, as we went through the 90s, we started getting more into the Japanese style, and that was something that Barry was always really into. Um, he really studied the Japanese art, especially of sword making. So we did a lot of swords in the 1990s, uh, a lot of katanas, a lot of wakasashis. Uh, Barry also worked on doing these new type of uh, subas that uh, he would make in-house. And we were becoming, uh, at that time, with people like Phil Hartsfield and them, uh, one of the top sword makers uh, of our uh, era. So uh, in about 2000 is when I came onto the scene. So. Uh, you know, we, we, at Dawson Eyes, we start from the ground up. So, uh, we're sweeping up the shop and, uh, you know, doing all the sandblasting and, uh, cutting out at that time was with a uh, metal bandsaw and cutting out blades and, uh, dealing with uh, a bandsaw that kept, uh, jumping off the rails. But, uh, you know, you know, you're, you're young and, uh, you has got what you got. You know, we had a 20 by 20 garage. And uh, it was a lot of fun. So we were making one-offs, uh, different types of blades. Uh, I learned a lot. So I learned a lot and started learning how to grind the blades. Uh, all hands-on. Everything was 100% handmade. Um, we had different people coming on to the scenes in the family. Lynn was there. Uh, Dennis Cook. So they all started having their own little styles. And so you'll see some Lynn knives out there. There'll be a few John Roy's, some Cook knives. They're all part of the Dawson family and a lot of Barry Dawson's. It wasn't until seven years ago that we came out of our garage into our first building, which was a 4,000 square foot building. And we started introducing some CNC uh, 
machining to it. And today we're in a 12,000 square foot building with half of our production in CNC machining and the other half is all handmade customs. Mm. Uh, let's go back. Uh, you, you said you learned everything from the ground up, uh, joining uh, the company as a young man in 2000. Uh, you learned directly from Barry Dawson himself. Uh, what what was he like and or what is he like and what was his experience before knife making? Uh, before Barry was into knife making, he was actually uh, in the Navy. Uh, he was actually in salvage and he was uh, stationed in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. So he was actually boots on the ground, uh, patching holes in ships and going out there in recovery uh, getting back whatever was damaged and then repairing them sometimes underwater. He actually got injured and then came stateside. Uh, after that, he started getting into knife making. He's he's incredible with his hands. And that's the thing that I learned about Barry. He was during, you know, he knew Chris Reeves. He knew a bunch of these guys, Boosie. Um, he knew uh, Jimmy Lyle. He, he knew all these guys back then. Uh, I've actually got to meet some of those guys. So it's it's been an experience. Um, it's all about perfection. So the one thing that he said is that you can't take forever on it, but you got to do it perfect. So uh, when we were starting, there was a lot of, we had what we called the wall of shame. And some of my first blades were up there, you know, and you know, you're learning, but it was kind of a tongue in cheek thing. And <laughs> but we, we got to see our progress. That was the main reason. So you could see where you started from and where you're ending up. And, and how much you have progressed through, throughout the time of uh, working with him. But he was a really kind man. He would give the shirt off his back. He had an amazing laugh. Um, he's still around. Uh, he comes by the shop just checking in on us on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, he comes up with the most incredible designs. Uh, a lot of them, and we're going to be jumping into that sometime in the future, but he always likes to play around with folders. Mm. So that's something that he likes to do. But the art, especially when we get into the swords, that is something that when we are making a sword, we literally put our blood, sweat, and tears and soul into it and to make this perfect piece that is not only balanced. That's the one thing about Dawson Knife swords. They're very well balanced, but extremely functional. For what? Who's buying swords these days? <laughs> uh, uh, quite a few people, uh, honestly. Um, Collectors. So we have collectors just because we've been around for a while, mm -hmm. but then we have enthusiasts. So we have actually have guys that um, are studying the arts so that they'll have Japanese or European. So European swords are be uh, becoming pretty huge. Uh, some of the guys are survivalist. So they want something that they know they can trust their life on. Uh, a lot of these guys are serious users. And so our swords have held up. We've done a lot of tests over the years. And that's why we choose the two steels that we do, CPM 3V and CPM Magna Cut. So I asked you that because obviously I love swords and um, I, I don't use them. But I, I asked if you would bring out, since we're talking about it, uh, let's see it right here. This is uh, um, something that to me I would love to own for certain reasons, but it's also extremely useful, it seems. Uh, we're looking at a double-edged uh, modern gladius. Uh, yes, with, we call it the Praetorian. The Praetorian. And uh, if you're not watching, it's got uh, it's a full tang with scales, but it also has a beautiful uh, Sukamaki wrap on the handle uh, and, and this incredible finish on the blade. What kind of finish is that? So that's our uh, Arizona copper. So the thing about this finish right here is it's the steel itself. So we actually get that out of tempering. So it brings out all the colors out of the steel, especially using CPM 3V or MagnaCut, you can actually temper it higher. So at about a thousand degrees and you really start to see the character of the steel. So that's what makes it so unique. It's not a paint on finish or anything of that sort. I mean, we do clear Cerakote it, but that's just the steel itself. Oh, that is cool. It is a really beautiful and unique finish that uh, you, you guys offer. I think you offer three different finishes but i, I want to get back to my snarky question who's who wants uh because not only this is not just a wall hanger and it's not just something that someone might want to practice martial arts with cut mat cutting and that kind of thing to me that seems like a serious tool you could bring into the field 
and you basically have uh, two edges. You know, you have yeah. double the life of that. Uh, if you can get by in the field without touching the spine of the of the blade, it seems it seems like it's a really practical tool as well as super cool weapon. Yeah, every single sword that we make, we have to field test. Uh, we have videos out there on YouTube or in Instagram where we actually do a bin test. So depending on the steel we use, uh, CPM 3V can take a lot more abuse than MagnaCut. I like MagnaCut a lot. It's great steel. It's stain resistant. So that's that's a plus for it. But when you're talking about like a uh, bin test and impact resistance, CPM 3V works really well. We can get some of our CPM 3V swords 60 degrees bin test Whoa. to spring back. Uh, we've ha had a couple that have actually gone 90. Um, they didn't they didn't spring back all the way, but pretty close, pretty yeah. close. But uh, impact resistance, um, we, we've tested through uh, mild steel tubing wow. uh, with no edge damage. So we're, we're pretty abusive to them. And then after that, after we do all that abuse, then we cut water bottles just to make sure that that edge is still holding up and that you can still swing through. And plus it's fun. But, so when uh, I'm sorry, As, when you're making swords, are you also making knives simultaneously? Yes, yes, okay. we do. So we're, we're actually training. I'm second generation in the family. So third generation uh, is learning how to grind. They, they do an excellent job. So all our knives are ground by them, and uh, they're learning now. One of them actually is doing swords. So one of them is grinding wow. our swords. He's gotten there. He's been with us for six years. Uh, he's a Dawson, and he is about 23 years old now. So he's he's been doing it for a long while. I, I love the family stories. I love family dynamics and or family knife stories. But this one is three generations deep. That's uh, that's pretty intense. Um, how how does that work? And and it seems like it's a nice little community, and it's a family too. You know, it, it is actually pretty amazing. So every day we don't kill our, ourselves or, or kill each other. You know, uh, we get along very well. Um, some of us in the family have been together uh, for 22 years, working together, building this business, doing different aspects. Dennis Cook, who uh, married Lynn, married into the business. He's like a brother to me. He's amazing. And he does a lot of the custom work that you see when you see a crusader sword or the Japanese, something with ivory, anything of that sort. He, he really works it out. And the next generation coming up, uh, we start them at the bottom so that way they can learn the fundamentals, how to use their hands, why, why we're designing a knife this way, how to grind it, how to shape it, how to even work with leather, kydex and how to sharpen a blade. So they're, they're learning everything every day. We, we have them come in usually after school um, when they start at 14 years old. So they're getting apprenticeship and we're building everyone up in the family. Now, whether they stay in the business, that's their choice, but there's so many aspects to it that uh, we find out that everyone stays in for some different type of aspect of the business, but they all have an appreciation and an understanding for knives, swords, and for American traditions. Uh, you, you were mentioning how um, with, the, with the numerous personalities, all, all creative forces, uh, yourself included, uh, Mr. Cook, uh, et cetera, that, that, that you all have different knives that are a part of your, your lineup. What would you say is the overriding unifying design philosophy for Dawson Knives? I think that the overriding philosophy is number one, it's got to be a tool. You got to be able to use it. And so we don't do a lot of fantasy stuff. And, and if we did, it's functional. So that's number one, functional. Number two is, hey, we, we do traditional on one end with the customs, but we also want to do new things, bring in the future. I don't want all our knives to look exactly like everybody else's knives. Uh, you go to Blade Show, and, you know, I've been doing that show for 22 years, 23 years now. And sometimes we just get stuck in a rut where everyone's making the same thing. We're just changing materials. So the blade patterns, everything's looking the same. And I, I want to grow 
uh, the knife industry into something that can look towards the future and have more function and be able to be different, you know, for the next 20 years. So that's kind of our philosophy in those two things. Uh, what would you say uh, from your perspective? Um, and I'm assuming, well, what would you say from your perspective is the last rut that say fixed blade knives, is something where we know, uh, uh, you know, that's your, the, those are the, your waters. What, what was the last rut that fixed blade knives suffered? I think that we get to a point where everyone in the industry likes to play it safe. I mean, we, we get some new designs, but I don't think we've grown too much past, you know, 2014. I think, uh, I mean, if, if you even go further back, I think after you saw like Boosie knives, you know, they, they had a, a really good tactical line. Uh, then we had strider knives and fixed blades, and then they moved on to folders. Um, I think that with fixed blades, nobody is trying to push the envelope. I think everyone just changes the designs to the newest steels, which is fine. But, you know, we have to make it new and, and exciting for the next generation. I, I see like my boys coming in at, you know, they play games, right? So uh, they play a game called like Halo. Mm -hmm. And so they, they look at this, you know, futuristic stuff and, and they say, hey, dad. You know, can we make something that looks kind of like that blade or how would you do that practical? And so something that looks a little more futuristic. And so it pushes us. So we actually have to make it practical and we have to add function. So if we have a hole, I'll show you an example. Like on this blade right here, that hole up at the top actually serves a function with this hole in the back. And so we can actually tie from here down to here to the back. And we have done it many a times, but we can make a spear out of this. Mm. So this whole blade can turn to a spear. Now, certain blade designs are more used for this. I mean, this is more of a parang style, but this is a screwdriver. So when we have the sheaths, it works for every screw on the sheath. So you can add attachments, change your uh, belt positions, you know, uh, you know, have more functionality between the sheath and the blade. Plus, you can also use it for the back end. You know, if you had to. Uh, break glass or uh, pry with it. So the idea is to add more function to it. And what will be coming out soon is the ability to change out handles. So you could do any color mm. change out handles is to be able to customize and upgrade your blades and, and still retain a type of functionality to it that that's different, that that's pushing a knife more. So would you say that uh, there has been that that sort of futuristic drive you were describing, say that your sons were pushing for, would you say that that's come out in in the aesthetics of your knives at all? Yes, absolutely. I would say within the last uh, three years, I, I would have to say that that has changed the look of our knives. Uh, a lot of people that have been following our uh, company has seen uh, a drastic shift uh, in our knife uh, designs and functionality of them. And I, I'm a traditionalist, so there's a lot of things that I like. I mean, I, you know, working on knives from the late 80s, uh, you know, from the 90s on forward. So, you know, in, in my opinion, you know, I kind of like the old, but, you know, looking forward and looking at, you know, just where we're going and, and how everything is advancing, I think that knives need to advance. I mean, it's, it was the original tool of mankind. So, you know, keep it uh, fresh, keep it moving forward. Well, uh, something I see Dawson Knives doing is uh, taking care to um, address the needs of people who EDC fix blades, such as myself, you know, uh, and you know, we all, many of us, uh, many people live in urban or suburban environments where you're not carrying it on your belt yet. Yes. Though I would love to walk around with a sword and a knife on my belt every day, like a big dork. Uh, I can't, uh, but I do love carrying fixed blades and they have to be, you know, a, a reasonable size. And, and I know that, that you guys have been making that one really cool Warren cliff that I love in that little nest. Oh, yeah. Uh, so when when did it come along? When did this idea come along to make EDC fixed blades? And tell me about those knives. You know what? 
uh, EDC is uh, actually a passion that Barry had. And that, that just carried on to us because, I mean, in our everyday lives, I mean, we can't always carry a big blade. Even as much as we want to, it, it's, you know, it, it can be kind of clumbersome, you know, just doing your daily activities. But you always need a blade. Yeah. And so I like a fixed blade because I'm not having to mess with the folder mechanism. You know, folders all have their place and fixed blades have their place. But having a fixed blade in your pocket is so unique. So our first attempts were in the 90s and we used to make a pocket sheath out of Kydex that would uh, had a tab that would slide into your pocket and that way it would still retain the knife when you pulled it out. And so we did a lot of those, of course, you know, being made out of Kydex, the little clips would break and mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'd have to replace the sheath and each sheath was uh, hand fitted so it took a while. Today we're getting ready to uh, release some part of our regular models, but in a in the Gen 2 scope, and the new sheath's already out for it, where you can add a uh, utility clip. Oh, so yeah. that way, yeah, and I love those clips. I mean, they're, and, and it's a great company too. So mm -hmm. a great company that has also um, has the same ideas and, and virtues that we do. But this little clip, you can screw it on there, and that way you can put it in your pocket with the sheath that is designed to be in the pocket, and uh, really work out like with with blades like you were talking about the revelation. Uh, we have a harvester. That's that's another one more, oh, yeah. a little bit more of a skinny blade. Um, and then you have two others, the outcast and the smuggler. So, you know, I, I think I see that growing a lot, and I see a lot of people really turning to fixed blades as long as the carry system allows yes. them to be functional inside the pocket and you know not too cumbersome. Yeah, there's a lot. I talk uh, a lot on this show recently about pocket carry fixed blade EDC because uh, I'm I'm a long time in the waistband carrier of EDC. Uh, but recently I've gotten a couple of uh, different knives that are optimized or, or actually they're not even optimized. They insist upon pocket carry. Um, uh, three of them actually uh, from different companies. And, and I'm uh, definitely... Um, I, I'm definitely intrigued, though I, I still keep going back to the the waistband. That's just habit. But if if someone is new out there and uh, starting or, or very interested in carrying a fixed blade, uh, going in the pocket is a is a great place to start or a great place to you know put your knife, so to speak. It's perfect. I mean, and that's that's one reason why we use the two steels that we do. Because the whole point of a fixed blade is to be tough, mm. but it has to hold a good edge because most of the time that it's in your pocket. So if, if you're comparing a folder to a pocket knife, a fixed blade pocket knife, that's why we like using CPM 3V and MagnaCut. So MagnaCut gives you the stainless capabilities. And for a stainless blade, it's remarkable as far as strength, edge holding, uh, its ability to... Uh, actually take some impact is, is pretty impressive. We've done a lot of tests with it. And same thing with CPM 3V, how tough it is, how the edge uh, wear resistance is about on par with MagnaCut. Um, so we, we like to get these two steels, plus they're American made, but putting them inside a pocket for an everyday EDC carry, because when you have that knife, what we have found is, is that people are going to be using it for intentions other than a knife. I mean, it's just going to, you know, whatever you're whatever happens in the real world, you're going to be using it for that because it's convenient. It's right there. And you'll think twice with your folder sometimes. I mean, not all the times, but sometimes. But with a fixed blade pocket knife, you're going to go full bore because of the strength. And we have tested that on farm chores. We've tested it on just regular chores. We've tested it out using like a screwdriver, all kinds of different tests. And we find that the fixed blade just holds up so much better and the people that we have given it out to for a fixed blade EDC really enjoy it and have actually gone from the folder to the fixed blade because of that. What have uh, what do you carry personally? Let's see here. So I like this one. This is kind of an in between. So this is the Nomad. So the finish is probably a little scuffed, but I just like that size. It's a traditional drop point. I mean, yes, it has some of the new features. I like using the screwdriver part in the back, and it's just handy. Being at that three and a half, a uh, little less than four inches, just works really well. It's only eighth inch thick or just slightly oversized. Um, and, and it's just perfect balance. It's perfect feel. And I can carry this in my pocket. So 
it's it's just very functional. It gives me a lot of blade. A lot of guys like smaller blades, and we offer those. But that's just what I do. I live kind of rural, so uh, it works out really good. But you know, I go into town a lot, and it's not off-putting. And a lot of people appreciate having it, especially if I'm hiking or something. That knife is always yeah. coming with me, and I can use it for a hiking chores. So that's that's what I carry is the Nomad, and it works pretty good. So how did you yourself get into knives and knife making? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, that was not my intent to start with. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that. I uh, actually went to school at ASU, and uh, I studied microelectronic engineering. So that's that's what I started doing. But um, as I started getting more into, uh, I, I married my wife, and that is. Her uncle is Barry Dawson. Mm. So as I started getting into their shop and helping them out, and I was a young man, I was 18 years old, and start going through that, I just found out that first off, um, the high-tech world is pretty stressful. But I mean, uh, I didn't mind the hours, but I wanted to have a life. Uh, it was a little more difficult uh, at Intel to have that. Uh, so I just really enjoyed working with my hands. And I enjoyed just the functionality and being able to produce something that I'm really proud of. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed that. And so that started driving my passion towards blades and then really coming up with different designs and then testing them because I wanted something real. I didn't want something fake. I wanted something that I could bet my life on. And in my family, I was the only one but uh, that didn't go into the military. But that's why we started making knives for the military. A lot of my family members did. And so hearing the stories and seeing how they needed to use them overseas and what kind of functionality and the quality, that was the other thing. The quality of blades were not there overseas and what we were giving to our servicemen. And so I made a vow that not only are we going to be American made, but we are going to source a raw material here in America. So all our raw material is sourced here in America. And we that's our pledge to not only our servicemen, but also to our customers. And as long as it's the raw material is still being produced here. And that's why I, I always give the motto and I tell everyone, keep your money in America. Not only can we produce some of the most uh, incredible products, but not we're helping each other out. And we're helping to keep those companies and that manufacturing here. So seeing what they were doing and helping doing uh, OEF and OIF. So uh, sending blades, we got a lot of plaques for that because our knives held up really well. We had videos of guys that could take the back end of our blade and sometimes the even the edge and going through bricks mm. um, and chopping through. There's a YouTube video out there of someone doing that. Uh, just showing them that in, no matter what need that had arise, because, you know, that's just a situation. We had guys that had to change a tire in the lug nuts. They, they couldn't get them off. So they had to chop off one of the lug nuts using one of our blades. So and they kept the nut uh, just to show us. So, you know, it, it, being able to perform in extreme conditions and you can only get that with American made. So uh, how many knives did you send over seas? Oh my gosh. Um, I would say somewhere in the ballpark. I mean, this is an estimate about 500 to a thousand. Wow. Well, so that's, I mean, you're talking about um, knives that can chop through walls, knives that soldiers, Marines, airmen uh, can trust their lives on uh, lives with. Um, so you're making something obviously very, very tangible something that can be handed down uh through through generations uh what there's like do do me a favor contrast the difference between creating something in the um in the high tech world because that's still creation you're you're even if you're writing code that's you're creating something and that something can also create other things so there's a lot of creation going on but what's the difference between creating something in the uh, virtual world and creating something in the real world you know, I, I've been on both ends of that aspect. So I, I could tell you that creating it in the real world is very nice because it's tangible. So you can hold it and feel it. But on the virtual world, the, 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 you know, especially with machining, CNC machining, you can actually write the code and actually see it being created. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes tangible. 
And that's pretty unique too. So, you know, both aspects are, are pretty incredible. I mean, especially today, my, my, both of my sons are going into CNC machining. Uh, they've been studying that since 14. Uh, they love it. Uh, one of them, uh, we have 3D printers. So one of them is made like a halo outfit. And so oh, that he cool. takes to airsoft and uh, he actually made it so it could handle the airsoft uh, pellet. So, you know, the BBs for that. Yeah. But uh, he, you know, it, it's tangible, you know, so being able to see your skills coming out and that you can create anything that you want and then have that actually be functional and tangible in the real world is an incredible thing. And that's something that we really need to bring back to America. Yes. And that's how we're going to get the youth excited to make things, make knives, manufacture. And, you know, you always have to do a combination. You know, everyone, you can't throw out the old because the old has so much understanding on why we we created things that way and the new is just to be able to assist us to create things that way so we still need to upkeep the quality the craftsmanship but we just need to have better ways of making it and so that's the beauty of marrying the technology with hands-on craftsmanship uh, i mean that's very encouraging to me because i hear lots of um uh I, I hear it quite a bit uh, through different conversations, stuff I read, stuff I hear in podcasts that uh, to a large extent, we've lost not only the capacity in this country to do things because we've outsourced it overseas to save money, but we've actually lost the ability. Like, like for instance, if we wanted to remake our our electrical grid and make it better. It's like, where would we start? We've got, we, we have lost some of that skill. And, and to me that, or, or some of that knowledge because we we've outsourced it and it's atrophied. And it just makes me think of lost civilizations, you know, that could have gone so far. And then for whatever reason, uh, probably some of the, their own undoing, um, they don't continue with and, and can't do things that they once could. Um, how, how do you think the, I mean, because your company has gone from a, 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 a garage and a homemade grinder to a, a very large facility with CNC machines. How have, how have you, uh, how has your company weathered that transition? Well, that, that's something I hear a lot too. Um, and, and, and we joined with other people like Titans of CNC. Uh, they're doing incredible work to combat this. Uh, this new generation. A lot of people are, they don't know what to make of it. Uh, I have three sons. They're all teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a different generation. But you just have to ignite that spark. And to ignite that spark starts in the home, starts with the family, starts with the ability to say, you know, my son or my daughter is a great asset, is gold irreplaceable. And they may not understand the same things that we do, but if you can ignite their curiosity, I, I did that with a 3D printer. You know, mm -hmm. that's how we got them off video games. And I said, okay, well, you're playing that game, but that's just a game. Don't, don't you want something real? I mean, how good would you do in real life? So let's get you into airsoft. Why don't you make that suit? And I challenged him. And that's the thing, ignite that and help them. And you know what? He ended up making a whole soup. Did he fail? A lot. He failed a lot. There was a lot of, you know, filament that we used up. But you know what? At the end, he made it. It was tangible. It was real. And now he got to run around and actually see what it was like. And now he loves it. And same thing with my oldest son. I mean, he, he started making something and he could create something. And ever since he started doing that, he started making knives. He started building parts for cars. He's big into cars now. He's working mm -hmm. on a 69 uh, C20. And see, they will get to that, but you have to bridge it. And the way you bridge it is with technology. If we just say, you know, hey, you know, they're just video game players stuck on social media and all that. Yes, they are. But you have to shift their focus and you do that by saying, hey, why don't you make what that's what's in that game? Or why don't you make what's over here? And then they'll have a love for manufacturing and then educate them in that way. Our education is not geared towards manufacturing at all. It's not geared towards an appreciation for knives. It's not geared for appreciation to a lot of our heritage. So if we bring that back, 
and we're able to show them that, hey, you can take these courses. I mean, there's a lot of certificates out there that they can take online that can get them going. That's what we started with with my sons. Uh, and then they start actually accomplish something. And now they have this certificate for the rest of their life. So it's not difficult. I just think that we just need to focus, refocus our attention and say, these are our priorities. Let's bring back American manufacturing. Let's bring back American goods. And let's bring back that drive and that spark for creation. So what has it been like, practically speaking, getting your sons and and the youngest generation of Dawson knives up to speed on creating knives that you can sell? Uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it takes work. But, um, you know, it's just letting, you know, don't be afraid to let them fail. They're, they're going to they're gonna fail. I failed. Uh, that's why we had the wall of shame. But keep it. Don't let their failures just go in a garbage can. That's too easy. Let them see where they started and where they're going and see how they're progressing. And when you can see that, then you feel like, hey, I'm making progress along my journey. You know, I, I'm starting to, to get the hang of this. And then use it. Go hiking. So we take them out hiking and say, hey, go hiking. Use this knife. Hey, I want you to create a fire. You know, this is how you do it. You know, dad could do everything, but that doesn't help them. Let's have them do it. Let's have them go out there. Let's have them use the knife. Uh, one thing that we make is a tomahawk. And so they love oh, yeah. that. They, they think that is so cool. Our tomahawk looks so different than anyone else's tomahawk. Throw it. Build a little thing so they can throw it. I built a little, um, you know, just using two by fours, cutting them up, putting them on some plywood and having a knife throwing. And, and they got to make the knives that they wanted to throw. The first knives that they were throwing were, you know, junk. But as they figured out, you know, hey, you know, there's certain designs, they got better and then they made better knives and they got better at throwing. So you got to get them involved so that way they can see what they're creating and what the purpose and the use is, and then they enjoy it. Uh, let's look at uh, a couple of knives. You have some around you, right? Yes, I do. So uh, I want to show you, uh, this is one like you were talking about, and this is, I love this. This is uh, inside the waistband or, you know, behind the back. This is one of my favorites, a Japanese style, and we call it the Kogai. We just released these. Uh, they're on there on the website for a pre-sale, but I love the weight. It's got a thick back. So you're talking about um, between 3 16 and quarter inch, but it's just amazingly balanced. And we do a Japanese interlocking wrap. So we actually learned how to do that properly. Uh, Barry taught us, it takes a long while to actually get it right, but once you do, it makes an incredible grip mm -hmm. um, and it's extremely functional, but it actually stays close to the body. And that's what's really important. So it's, it's very concealable, uh, but extremely functional. And it's got a slight hollow grind. So that way you get a good edge. I'll see if I can show it up here. Yeah. Oh, that is beautiful. Yeah. We're talking about a fixed blade Quaken with a, with a Japanese cord wrap handle. Um, yeah, I love that sort of proper cord wrapped handle. Um, it to me, it gives some of the best grip there is. You know, um, coming out laterally, your 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 the fat of your palm sinks in, and then your fingers oh. find a spot, and it just holds. It's great. You know, I I, I love that. You know, I, I I do a lot with G10, and that's a lot of machining. But when it comes to this wrap, that's all hand done. Mm. I mean, we just literally wrap, you know, hundreds of knives. And it's all done by hand. And, and, you know, the one thing you, that you learn when you're doing that is that you'll get a really good grip, you know, having to pull that tight all the time as oh, you're yeah. <laughs> doing the interlocking. Because you got to keep it as you work that. And when you get to a large sword or even like a katana, you, you got to hold that the whole way down. You loosen up, then you'll have a little part where it's a little loose. So you have to or you have to start all the way back to that point and do it again. So it teaches you that discipline and it makes it really incredible. So that's one of my favorite knives, the Kogai. Uh, it's a brand new one that just came out. Uh, How long is that blade? Excellent. That blade is right at about five inches. Okay. I love it. I love it. And you've got like a interesting little Spanish notch or something uh, in yes. the Ricasso there. Perfect. That's exactly it. So not only does it give you a little bit of a sharpening choil right here, but it also allows you, um, instead of putting a blood groove, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of having blood grooves in my knives, 
-hmm. But this creates uh, something so if you're functionally using it, it won't, whatever happens won't get on your hand. So it'll drip there. So it's it's very unique. It, it's functional, but it allows you to sharpen your blade back. So it's a great um, sharpening choil too. Right, right, right. You're not going to run into the into the ricasso and get that little smiling feature. Um, yeah, I, so I, where it's really thick there too. You can't really sharpen it, so it makes it easier to sharpen. So I'm, point, I, I'm before we move away from the yeah. ki, kaidan. It's called. Uh oh, th this knife is the cool yeah. guy. Kogai, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Before we leave the Kogai, I just say, I have to say, I love those little kind of visual flourishes. Uh, you've done it. I've noticed it. Um, I got to be honest. It's like the first thing I noticed about the knives you were selling on Blade HQ at the time. I noticed you, you, you had a finger guard that came down just a little bit longer and it had an, uh, a, a, like a big notch yes. uh, allowing for that uh, sharpening, but it also looks dramatic. I love it. It looks like an old school fighting knife kind of flourish uh wh where'd that come from so a lot of that comes to so um just from using knives and 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 the aesthetic has to be as much as the function so sometimes you can have a really functional knife but it just doesn't look good but in that particular knife you just want to be able to get as much hand protection but you want to add some art to it you know add some art to the function if you look at a lot of older knives they're very functional but they added some beautiful art oh, yeah. to it. And that's something that sometimes we can get a little bit too caught up on function and then forget the art side of it. So, I mean, machines, they, they could do it well, but sometimes it slows down manufacturing time. So people are like, well, we'll, we'll make it as basic as we can so we can slam out a bunch of knives. Mm -hmm. And you could do that, but then where's the soul? Yeah. Right? That little bit just adds that little bit of soul into it. And that just a little bit of that person and a little bit of that art. That's funny. I agree. Um, I, I love a quote unquote clean design as much as the next guy. Uh, but sometimes I'm like, oh, is that is that like a clean design? Like they can't make a complex design, <laughs> just like I used to paint abstract when I didn't feel like actually painting a figure because that's difficult, you know, but, uh, you know, um, I, I, I think that's extremely well said. By the way. <laughs> no, well, thank you. But I mean, some some people you can tell it's a part of their aesthetic, and other people it's just like mm, maybe a little too clean for you. <laughs> um, so uh, with with the new generation coming up, and and you've got some new um sort of influences coming yeah. in uh, the design. But what are what are some of your uh, um kind of stable designs that you keep coming back to? I think you were about to pick one up there. Well, I was going to show you, actually, this, this one combines both of them. So yeah. this is one that I designed with my son. Mm. So this is, this is pretty cool. This is coming out Thursday. So this is not even out yet. Wow. So this is coming out Thursday. And I really like the Parang style blade. So it's just so good for chopping. And it, 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 it just makes a really tough knife that just screams survival. And I've used a rank style uh, machete before. And so creating a survival knife with it. So with that aspect of it, um, my son came in and he's all like, okay, dad, so we're gonna add the screwdriver and we're gonna put this nice sharpening choil right here. So, so that'll look really good. And we'll still have the tie down there and then we'll make more of a drop right here. So. That way it's not such a wide head. So sometimes I can get caught up in sheaths and makes it a little mm. awkward. Mm. And so it combines two, two different styles. So uh, so this is a throwback to some of our older ones. Uh, my old prang design back then was called the Zombie Slayer. <laughs> and uh, so, it, yeah, right. And so, <laughs> so now we take this uh, aspects of that with this new design. So that way you have two generations coming through the designs oh, that's cool. uh, that, yeah. that you get to see coming out Thursday. And, and it also has a real, um, well, like you mentioned, it's a Parang. So it's, it's coming from Southeast Asia and, and uh, well, I guess Malaysia and Philippines. I love those styles of blades and I love the way that one looks in particular. And it does widen out just a little bit towards the yeah. tip. Uh, add a little bit of heft up there, but it's not like you said, it doesn't look like it's going to get all bound up 
in trying to draw it. Um, I want to ask you about the process about how these are made. But before we do, you mentioned, I don't want to forget this. You mentioned earlier before we started rolling that you have a Filipino sword in the offing. Is this what you were talking about? Okay. So the Filipino sword, um, I'll have to bring out a design. I, we already have it. Uh, we've offered it once, maybe twice on our website. Uh, but we only made like one. And uh, this time we're going full bore. We're going to be offering them down the line um, soon. But uh, our Filipino sword is about 20 inches. It's almost kind of like a bolo style. So it has that curvature and then the head gets wider and it's partially sharpened on the back end and mm -hmm. then has the full sharpen on the other end. And it's perfectly balanced. So you can put your finger right there, right where the handle starts. And so that way you have perfect uh, motion and movement with that sword. And it's it's pretty nifty. Um, once you see it, it's uh, unlike any of the other swords that we've ever made. Uh, it's extremely fast, very quick. Uh, we've dealt a lot with a lot of guys in the Filipino martial arts. A lot of them are good customers of ours. And uh, that was kind of a request. And so we made a, a couple, you know, for these guys. But now we're finally going to release it so that way our customers can have a chance at it. Ah, I can't wait. I cannot wait to check. So are we going to see one of those at Blade Show? I know you're going to be there. Uh, probably not at Blade yet. Okay. Uh, it's going to be coming out around July. So uh, we're, we're getting it uh, ready for July. I still want to do a couple little more tests. Our guys are getting a really cool looking Kydex sheath that works with it very well. Carbon fiber Kydex look and uh to really uh set it apart all right so listen up guys uh time to save up for the <laughs> filipino dawson short 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 sword coming up so how in general are are the knives made um uh you, you indicated how uh the the start was very very simple and now it is uh, a well-oiled machine tell me how they're made uh first we we talk you know it's it's pretty unique um you know, we might have a barbecue, you know, families getting together and uh, we'll just uh, we'll just share designs. So it's different than most people who have barbecues. So because we're a knife making family. So we'll bring out different designs. Barry will have his. We'll have ours and we'll talk about it. And even the kids, I mean, they'll get into it. And so uh, we'll take aspects of different designs and uh, or, or we might say, you know, that whole design's awesome. Let's bring that in. And so it, it starts there with that creativity process. And then after that, um, either I or uh, my sons will draw it up. And so we'll get into SolidWorks. Um, and then once we get into that, uh, we have a water jet. So we'll cut them out. Um, water jets are slow, but there's no heat affected zone. So I'm mm. very much about messing with anything that's heat uh, related. So. Uh, we actually heat treat plates. So we'll, we'll cut the plates up and then we'll heat treat the plates. And when we bring them out, we'll cut them hard on uh, on a water jet. Oh, you you heat treat the whole thing before you even cut out the, the blade? Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's cool because I've, I've heard, you know, I've heard a lot of different uh, ways of doing it. Haven't heard that. That sounds that sounds fascinating because uh, you're, you're saying that water jet is already kind of a slow process. And yeah. you're doing it to harden 3V or or yeah. magna cut, so that's that's no walk in the park, I would imagine. No, it isn't. And first, uh, we'll, we'll surface grind all the plates and we'll check for impurities beforehand before we heat treat. So we want to make sure that uh, what we're seeing is what we're getting. Um, sometimes you can already put all that manufacturing and cutting out the blade and spending all that time, and then you heat treat it. Now you're seeing all these problems, and you already lost all that steel. It's a lot easier to even track it if you're doing it by the plate uh, before you invest all that time cutting it all out uh, yeah. and, and bringing it to production. Um, we use uh, Niagara Specialty Metals, uh, you know, so Niagara Steel, and we love the guys. They're, they're American made um, and they produce really good stuff. I know there's a, a lot of people that have some videos about, you know, oh, we have these problems here or there. And um, well, I mean, problems happen but i mean as far as us we've used them for many 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 years and they have done an excellent job uh and if we ever have a problem i'm not saying we don't but if we ever do we just let them know 
Uh, and that's why we can catch it in that early process before we've invested all the time in cutting out all the blades. So after we surface grind them, then we heat treat it. Now we, we've inspected it, we've rock well tested it, um, and then we start cutting it. And so once it gets through that cutting process, we'll, we'll, we'll kiss it one more time on the surface grinder just to clean up any of the, uh, you know, any D car, but you re usually don't have much, but just to clean it up. And then it goes from that point to the mills. So we'll profile around them. And right now, uh, we're making a transition to the mills, but right now we are hand grinding them. Hmm. And we have uh, three guys that'll do it. And each guy can hand grind 40 blades a day. Oh my God. Are you talking about putting the bevels on? Yeah. Holy They'll do 40 mackerel. blades and, a day. And, and we're talking about Especially. already heat treated steel. That's Yeah. We have wow. to keep it cool. I mean, you're running coolant you know, on your yeah. grinders all the time. And so our belts wow. have to be able to take that water. Yeah. And we're watching them. We're very particular. Even after that, we'll check just to make sure that uh, the rock well is still good. So if we have any problem, uh, but most of our guys are really good. They're trained into it. Um, but we're moving to the machines just because it'll be easier. And I like to take the talents of those guys and move them straight into customs. So mm -hmm. uh, we have routing machines that do all the handles. They'll get all the handles prepped. And then we'll also have um, our mills take care from that point. Everything in sheath work is pretty much hand done. Uh, we'll also uh, sharpen them, hand sharpen every single blade just to make sure the bevel's right. We'll get the edge angle set right, and then we'll run it through the process. And then we test every single blade. So as soon as they get done, we test for cutting. We test a little bit for strength. And then once we think it fit, and if everything meets right, it goes out. If it doesn't, it goes back to be fixed. Or if that doesn't work, then it becomes an honorary test blade that we just use to put it through extreme test. Uh, how did you see things change in your process once you started, uh, once you adopted powder metallurgy steel? A lot. <laughs> um, you know, uh, first off, I, I'm really happy with powder uh, metallurgy steel because, especially the Crucible CPM, uh, first, I know I'm getting 100% American made. So that's really big for me. Uh, I probably won't use anything else but CPM steel. Um, number two, it is just high performance. That really is. Uh, it, it is the future of steel. Uh, you, that, I mean, we've used everything from D2, 440, ATS 34, 154 CM. We've used 5160, L6, uh, um, ADCRV2. Um, we, we've used it all. And so, so we, we have a very extensive knowledge on all these different steels. But I have never seen anything just, especially with CPM 3V, that has just performed, that could just take abuse like no man's business. I mean, I literally can almost not destroy that steel. I'll give you an example really quick. We were testing for tomahawks, and we were thinking of going with MagnaCut. Uh, MagnaCut is awesome. But when we were doing impact uh, resistance and, and just seeing uh, how well it can take impact, uh, this magna cut just uh, we could get some cracks hmm. uh so on the magna cut um but for stainless that's incredible i mean with the abuse that we're doing we took the cpm 3v and we went ahead and hit the anvil at full blow and we cracked the anvil yeah so without hurting the steel and wow. so yeah and so we have test videos of that so that's what i mean I, i've just never seen a steel like that and and that's in that powdered metallurgy so that's why we use these two steels, because if, if you're skinning and, and you're bushcrafting, see, uh, Magnica works great because it's a little bit more edge. And if you're in an environment like Florida, mm -hmm. go for it. You know, it's going to be awesome. So that's why we use that. And if you are a pure survivalist and you just want a blade that will never break, CPM 3V is, is the ticket on that. So did it... Um, uh... Did the adoption of those steels mean that you had to buy more expendables like belts and other things? Did that did that change all of that, uh, uh, how you do business that way? Yeah, we actually had to come up with our own proprietary heat treat too. 
So, oh, wow. Oh, no kidding. So our heat tree doesn't follow the exact standards. In fact, we can actually get a hard line on CPM 3V steel, and we can get uh, a hard line on MagnaCut also, so on both steels. Um, but yeah, we, we watch our consumables go up. We watch the uh, different types of belts. Now it's bits uh, mm. being used uh, and keeping it cool. Just, you know, once you learn one, once we had 3V down, we're like, all right. And then we went to Magnica and we're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was well, a whole different ball game. What, well, uh, you know, um, you're three generations in, you're, you're obviously full steam ahead. What do you think the main challenges are going to be for Dawson Knives uh, going into the future? You know, I, I would have to say uh, uh, not to be complacent, to keep changing, to keep pushing it. Sometimes we find something that works and that's all we want to do. Uh, I have learned to be malleable, humble, and to really listen to what our customers say because they're the most important asset of this company and to really impart that because nothing is going to be more important than what the feedback your customers are giving you. I've had to change my sheets out a lot. Uh, my first original design, some of my customers who are probably watching this will be like, yeah. <laughs> and, and and always evolving, you know, it just keep going, you know, uh, take criticism, take it in stride. And, and that's something I, I try to impart to the next generation to be humble. And, and, and I say the last thing I think that is the most important just because of who we are as a company, uh, faith in God. You know, that's something that's really big in my generation, but being lost in the next generation mm -hmm. and to really stick with that, you know, and that, that helps you be humble. That helps you to find peace. That helps you to be focused. And it helps you to know that you're not always in control and that you're not you know, perfect, that uh, you're always striving to be better and to be grateful. Well, John, that sounds like the perfect place to uh, to wrap this up. Of course, you and I are going to talk a little bit more for our Patreon members, but um, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and talking Dawson Knives. Um, you're going to be at Blade Show, and uh, if, if people are listening to this, uh, well, Actually, Blade Show has already happened by the time people are listening to this. Like I said, happy Father's Day. But uh, I hope you have a very successful show. And uh, 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 I guess uh, since that was in the past now, I loved checking out your knives in person. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Bob. Oh, a little caveat uh, for your listeners. Uh, we are going to give them a 15% discount. Uh, the discount code will be Knife Junkie. So right. that way they can have that. And uh, and I really appreciate being on the show, uh, being able just to share our family story and a little bit about some great American manufacturing. Oh, man, John, the pleasure has been mine. And thank you so much for that very generous 15 percent uh, uh, off on the purchase of a, of a Dawson a knife at your website. Code is junkie. Really appreciate that. Yes. Thank you, John. Thank you. You know, the more knives you get, the more 15% off actually saves you. So uh, look at it that way. We could all be walking around with Praetorians uh, by this time next year on our waist. Uh, there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. John Roy of Dawson Knives. Really love their stuff. Uh, be sure to check them out. Follow them on Instagram. Uh, they seem to update on the, on the regular. And I hope you were at Blade Show and enjoyed checking out their work there. I also hope you came up and said hello to me. Uh, and uh, to all you fathers out there, happy Father's Day. Your uh, job is very, very important and cannot be uh, undersold. So uh, stick to your guns no matter what anyone says. Happy Father's Day. I love you all. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.